to the next product innovation panel, New Food Development. This is going to be moderated by Gordon Bacon of Pulse Canada. The panelists include Manuel Gosh, Alimentos Naturales, Spain, Paolo Pedon of Pedon, Italy, Peter Semler of Agrisim Global Brokerage, Australia. May I please request Gordon Bacon to grace the dais. Stepping up, we have Paolo Pedon, who is Export Director at Pedon SPA, the retail division of the Pedon Group. He started off with a degree in agribusiness and joined the family company, essaying various departments including quality control, quality systems, audits, models and research and development. His experiences include packaging design, strategic planning, innovation, and he's also on the board of ASABIO, the Italian Association of Organic Food Manufacturers and Retailers. Joining us on this panel, Peter Semler, Principal Agrisim Global Brokerage Australia, which he established in 2008, actively involved in all levels of the Australian pulse industry, from R&D through commercialization of new varieties, to creating tailor-made commercial programs focused on least cost pathways for export clients. He's been actively involved in marketing and export of agricultural products out of Australia for the past three decades. You'll hear of him and you'll read of him as he writes about the Australian market for a number of Canadian Pulse publications. Also on board, Manuel Gosh, who trained as a lawyer and as an economist, has a career in different fields. In the academic field, he's a, he was chairman board of directors, University of Aladiod. He's also part of the Quality Club of Spain. He works for the, has worked for the Spanish government in various departments, including as chief of technical office, Ministry of Commerce, the Under Secretary of Trade, including others, of course. And uh, he has a rich experience in different companies, especially in the food company, where he's a chairman and board of several companies, including Alimentos Naturales, which has subsidiaries in Portugal and Algeria. And of course, Gordon Baker needs no introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, he was here with us on the days yesterday. He's the CEO of Pulse Canada and the CEO of Special Crops Association. Prior experiences include Director Market Development of the Canadian Wheat Board, and he has had several federal and provincial positions in government in Canada, besides, of course, being actively involved with the family farm in Saskatchewan. So, ladies and gentlemen, for this very special session on product panel, innovation, new food development, it's over to Gordon Bacon, Pulse Canada. Well, I think this is a really interesting panel discussion to have immediately following a spirited discussion about the demand for red lentils because although the title of our panel is New Food Development, it's really about new pulse demand, uh, an emerging area of demand in the food industry, where we're at now, what the opportunities are, and the kinds of responses uh, that the pulse industry needs to have to address some of these emerging interests and ongoing and active and growing interests. I'm gonna start this presentation with a short four minute video. So um, if we can roll that video and then we're gonna get into uh, some discussion and presentations from some of our panelists. To survive on planet Earth, we need certain natural resources like soil, water, and air. These are the basic building blocks of life. I'm Peter Watts with Pulse Canada. Let's take a look at how we're doing to protect the things that give us life. On a global basis, five to seven million hectares of farming land is lost through erosion and degradation every year. That's an area about the size of Nova Scotia. On average, it takes around 3,000 liters of water to produce enough food for one person for one day. And when it comes to air, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are the highest they've been in at least 650,000 years. At the same time, we're using these resources that are essential to life. We're having to feed more and more people. It took until the 1800s to reach a billion people. Less than 250 years later, we've reached 7 billion. So the question is, what can you and I do to help protect these resources? One of the ways we can help is to pay attention to the food we eat each day. The good news is that eating pulses like peas, 
beans, lentils, and chickpeas can make a big difference. Pulses use half the non-renewable energy inputs of other crops. Each time a farmer chooses to grow pulses instead of another crop, he or she can reduce energy inputs by 50%. In Canada alone, this means a reduction of greenhouse gases equal to removing 200,000 cars from the road each year. President Roosevelt once said, a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. In the area of Canada where pulses are grown, 82% of farmland is protected through no-till or conservation tillage. Reducing or eliminating tillage protects the soil from wind and water erosion and helps to build organic matter. See this crop of peas? They're increasing healthy microbial activity in the soil. The pea plants are actually improving the land for next year's crop. Finally, water. Water is an essential resource for all of us. The good news about pulses is that they use way less than any other plant or animal source of protein. And that's what it's all about, producing more with less. So the way I see it, pulses are a big part of the solution to feeding 9 billion people in 2050. What can you and I do? We can start by making the right decisions, like what we choose to grow and eat. One farmer, one consumer, one planet, one choice at a time. Because a lot of little choices add up to big things. And that's going to be good for things here at home. I just wanted to set the stage uh, for the discussion we're going to have and uh, I'm going to ask Manuel to speak first. Uh, Alimentos Naturalis is, a, is a, a big company in the food business having operations in Europe and North Africa. Manuel, I'd like to uh, hear some of your thoughts about uh, the kinds of uh, challenges and the opportunities we have with the pulse industry to, to meet some of the need and interest that is there and the kinds of future needs that you see and challenges we'll have to overcome to capitalize on that. I, I personally think that the uh, uh, pulse sector uh, needs uh, to be changed, needs innovation. Uh, probably in the, in the food sector is one of the sectors that has been treated the same way over the last uh, many, many years. And I personally think that when we talk about uh, innovation, uh, which means normally to add value to the product you already have, uh, in this case, I should point out uh, three uh, main questions. Uh, we need to innovate in the product. We need to innovate in the way the product is presented let's say, the, the packing, the, the, the state of the, the product. And third, I think we should consider the financial problem. I mean, how much does it cost to invest for innovation and whether the consumer is ready to pay for this innovation? In the, case, in the first case, the case of innovate the product, I think what we should do is to reinforce the advantages and the qualities that pulses have. And on the second hand, to avoid the disadvantage that they also uh, have. For example, what was mentioned yesterday by you about the amino acids, well, I think this, uh, let's say, uh, problem sh could be uh, corrected or avoided by the way the pulses are uh, processed. Not only working on the agricultural field, but also in the industrial field by processing uh, differently. Eh? And uh, this is what I have to say uh, so far about product. About packing, things that pulses have been changing from bulk, packet, cooked products, 
uh, uh, in cooked, we had teams after we had glasses, and today we are starting to have uh, plastic materials. But there is always a problem on that, and the problem is, is the consumer ready to pay a cooked pulse on a plastic bag, which is more expensive than if it's done on a tin? Have we been able to convince the consumer of the advantage of uh, such innovation? That's why I want just to finish my uh, intervention by saying uh, money is very important. Not, not only the money needed to invest it, but also and more the perception of the consumer about if it's worth the money, the extra money they have to pay for some innovation impulses. And today, I think there is a lot of work to do on that specific field. Thank you. Well, those are some fantastic comments. And uh, Paulo, I'm, I'm going to call on you next to, to, uh, to uh, address kind of the same issues. And, and Paulo has a, a presentation from PDOM. And uh, I think you framed it well in terms of uh, innovating in product, innovating in packaging, and, and innovating in, uh, the fine, in providing value to consumers. So, Paulo, I'm going to ask you to, uh, to uh, give a presentation. And uh, I know that some of these themes are covered in, in what you're you. going to cover. So, good morning to everybody, and thank you very much uh, for, for attending. Uh, my name is Paolo Pedon, and I am the Chief uh, Marketing Officer of uh, Pedon Group. Uh, first of all, I want to confirm you that passes uh, are very healthy. Uh, you can see it on myself. Eating passes uh, five times per week, uh, you can look like uh, 10 years uh, younger. Uh, so, uh, Pedon is one of the leading players uh, in Europe in passes. Uh, we have two divisions, uh, Pedon for retail and Ecos for, uh, for, for uh, industrial supplies. Today, I would like to take you uh, through some folks uh, uh, with the objective to let you understand the role that passes may have in the future in terms of food and nutrition and the importance, uh, as Manuel said, uh, of the innovation. So nowadays in the world, uh, there is one billion people uh, suffering from hunger, and one, more or less one billion people experiencing troubles because of overnutrition and uh, obesity. This is the first paradox. Then uh, uh, you should know that uh, one third of the total, the global food production is addressed to the livestock. So livestock, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which co contributes significantly to the pollution, to the climate change, uh, absorbs so, mu so much food. In the meantime, a uh, growing proportion of uh, food is uh, being used for, by fuel. So in a certain way, we can say that uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, feeding people, we are feeding animals and cars. Uh, as per uh, uh, the video shown by Gordon, in 2050, there will be 9 billion people on the planet. Uh, beside uh, uh, the growth in terms of uh, uh, population, uh, thanks to the uh, growth of the economies of the um, uh, developing countries, uh, there will be the, the average uh, per, per capita income in the world will increase dramatically. Uh, this will produce uh, a boom in the request of food. It is expected that to feed those 9 billion people, uh, the global food production should double. Uh, with, the current, uh, with our current uh, lifestyle, it is demonstrated that uh, uh, in 2050, uh, we will need three planets. And clearly, this is not possible. So uh, the qu big question is, what has, what has to be done uh, for the future? So uh, we have to change. We have to change our eating habits. 
uh, we have uh, to uh, choose uh, healthier food and we have to pay attention to the uh, impact on the environment of the food uh, and uh, uh, also to look at the cost of the food in relation with uh, the intake of uh, certain food can give us uh, in terms of uh, calories and nutrients. So, uh, uh, as regards the you know, uh, nutrition, uh, nowadays we know very well uh, uh, the classification of the food in terms of uh, their healthy characteristics, and we know that pulses are uh, 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 located on the bottom of the uh, food pyramid. So uh, we know very, very well they are very healthy. Uh, we have to, uh, to start looking at the uh, eco-sustainability of different types of food. Uh, Passes are great substitution of meat. And if we compare uh, uh, the impact on the environment of passes compared to uh, meat in terms of production, uh, we can clearly see uh, how passes are much more uh, eco-friendly uh, in terms of uh, carbon footprint, in terms of water footprint, and in terms of what it is called ecological footprint. So, uh, uh, passes are also eco-sustainable. Okay, so this is a new model of the food pyramid in which uh, beside the, something like the uh, nutrition value of the product, uh, we have uh, the environmental pyramid show, uh, showing the, the eco-sustainability of different types of food. Okay, looking at the cost, uh, a survey made in Italy last year uh, demonstrated that uh, a vegetarian uh, diet model uh, is the cheapest, uh, the cheapest uh, eating, eating habit. Uh, uh, and uh, in the meantime, uh, a meat-based menu is the most expensive. So, uh, passes, which is part of uh, a, a staple food in a, in a vegetarian diet uh, we know to be also uh, very cheap compared to many other types of food. So, uh, we have to get very conscious about the, uh, you know, the good characteristics of our, our product, the, 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 the food we deal with. So, passes as healthy, eco-sustainable, and an affordable food. Uh, you see here where they are located in the new double pyramid, so very close to the bottom, in the best position, nearly in the best position. Nowadays, in, the, uh, in most advanced markets, uh, passes, grains, seeds are very trendy. Uh, people know the healthy benefits of passes, but are afraid about the long cooking time and the messy preparation. So, uh, it is very important to invest in innovation. Innovation uh, can uh, help to uh, maintain alive our category uh, and possibly to re revitalize our, our products, our category. Uh, you see here uh, the life cycle of, of passes. Uh, so, as Pedon, we follow three basic rules in terms of new product development, simplicity, convenience, and well-being. Every time we uh, have to conceive a new product, uh, we uh, explore all possible uh, ways uh, to uh, bring new attributes to the product in terms of uh, healthy, in terms of uh, uh, convenience, uh, and uh, any other uh, options uh, which can add uh, value for the consumers. Okay, uh, normally we think about innovation uh, only in terms of formulation, in terms of ingredients, uh, but uh, uh, for supporting uh, our products, it is very important to innovate also in terms of cooking the rations, in terms of packaging, in terms of marketing. So. Uh, okay, it is uh, 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 very important the formulation, 
uh, but not only. Uh, so CC asked me not to show any Pedon products during the presentation, so I'm going to show you some great innovative products from across the world. Here you see some pictures taken in the UK. UK again, with many different, uh, very interesting products. This is Russia and Canada. Israel, South Africa, France, the US. Packaging uh, is uh, an important tool for, for, for innovation. Food manufacturers nowadays are requested uh, to be flexible, uh, to be practical, and uh, to be eco-sustainable. Uh, in general, every market uh, uh, likes different uh, types of, uh, of packaging. We see here, you know, from the past to the, to the present, uh, in the advanced markets, uh, how the packaging changed. So from the loose product, you see the pillow bag, you see more modern types of bags, until very sophisticated uh, packaging with, uh, for example, protective atmosphere to uh, better retain the freshness of the product, the resealable tab, and we see in the future. Uh, trade packaging is also very important. Beer retailers are very demanding in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, trade packaging. Okay. Uh, marketing. Uh, unfortunately, most players in our industry uh, uh, traditionally never dedicated, allocated the big resources to the marketing. But marketing is a, uh, uh, you know, a crucial factor uh, uh, to attract new uh, consumers. Uh, there are many routes uh, which can be explored, uh, sometimes even spending much money. Uh, I want to show you today a great case history, which is the Sugat company in Israel. I believe one of of the best marketing in our industry. Uh, Sugat is the market leader in passes in Israel. This is a snapshot of their website. Uh, they have a collection with hundreds of recipes, uh, a wonderful uh, section about health and nutrition. Uh, you see the link uh, at their uh, Facebook page, and uh, uh, the they website hosts some big chefs, and uh, they even uh, developed uh, uh, an application, an app for iPhone, which uh, uh, allows you to easily plan your meal using the Sugat product. And uh, finally, they have uh, an amazing uh, YouTube channel with many video recipes. Video recipe is an, uh, an incredible tool to push people uh, to try uh, the product. And uh, you can download it uh, from the web and uh, follow the recipe on your smartphone or tablet. Now, Peter, uh, as I'm introducing Peter Semler, I I'm, I'm looking at Gavin Gibson down at the front of the audience. And, uh, you know, Gavin and I have known each other for probably 14 years. And I always relied on Gavin to say the controversial things, to really shake things up. So, Peter, I'm kind of looking at you now, and I'm hoping that you're going to come up here and uh, say, you know, sort of follow in what I would consider, you know, sort of a, the Gavin Gibson model of shaking things up. So, Peter, I I'm, 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 don't want to set you up and, uh, and have you difficult, but uh, the last panelist I'd like to invite up to Peter. Thanks. We do different, we do, one of the hazards of being the third speaker following on from my two colleagues is um, you really need to be able to rewrite your speech in midstream. But I'll try to steer clear of what they've said and, and try to let you look, see how we do things in Australia. I thought I'd, I'd come at it from a different angle. I mean, the previous presentation was awesome. I mean, I wish I had a, a marketing department who could come up with products like that and whatever else. In Australia, we do things a bit differently. We have to get, we're a long way away. We have to sort of get back to fundamentals and where I think in a SWOT analysis that would be a new new, we're probably an old new or a new old. So the way as it's evolved in Australia, I don't know whether it's set out to do this, is that we've probably found a product and then we've found out that it actually fits the problems. But a lot of the problems that it now fits didn't even exist when 
the lupins first started. So like all, if there are any Australians out here, they're probably all doing trades out in the main hall, but lupins are nothing new to Australians, but the, the scale we grow them is, is quite unique in, in the world pole scene. So um, let's progress on this. Um, lupins have been around a long time. They've been around in, in various countries and have been used as a foodstuff. Um, Back in the early mid-60s, a couple of enterprising folk in Western Australia uh, were trying to find a rotation to, to be able to grow wheat better. Uh, and lupins, one of them had the bright idea that lupins would be able to be adapted to the harsh um, agronomics of the West, which is very sandy, broad acre kind of farming to give them a, a cereal pulse rotation and get all the benefits of growing cereals. Anyhow, um, oh, that's just a bit more where lupins are coming from. Anyhow, so uh, we ended up with the lupinus angustifolius, which turned it into a big broad acre crop. I feel very embarrassed because I did all these slides on my apple and I gave them to the man in the corner and he put them on a, um, on a um, IBM, whatever they're called, and of course they've come out with a bit of extraneous material, so please, please forgive me for that. Um, the target market originally for lupins was stock feed, as has been for many pulses, but some people thought a long time ago that, that um, there's got to be better things to do with lupins, and so the, um, <coughs> the, the process of evaluation started. Why, why, why am I talking about lupins? Well, that'll become more obvious because we'll then talk about the problems of the, that we face as an industry and we face as a society and why they could be really handy. So, uh, right, I don't know, this button's not helping me. Um, lupins have got some really interesting characteristics as you can see there. Uh, very high pro this is um, before anyone jumps down my throat this would be for processed like lupin flour the high protein is around 40 percent very low carbohydrate very low glycemic load uh, very very high fiber um, up to 40 percent which is very useful in this day and age of health problems also the gluten free which seems to be becoming more and more important um, so these, how do these characteristics start solving the problem? And uh, my colleague previously, my previous colleague identified this paradox that um, we have all these people going to bed hungry at night, uh, yeah, hungry at night, and then we have people who have rather terrible uh, health problems because they've made, shall we say, not good food choices. Um, so I thought I'd try and identify, I mean, everyone's talked about obesity, they've talked about uh, diabetes and whatever, and it, uh, they're horrible, but how horrible are they? I mean, there's been an, an amazing shift in the dynamic uh, of, of these problems in the last 30 years. To highlight the gravity of the situation, I, I have to regrettably use my own country, Australia, and you know, you sort of stand up here and it's, oh God, what's that? Oh, okay, that's. It's not a good look. Australia is today ranked as one of the fattest nations, and in Australia you've got to be very careful with words like that because we're very politically correct, so shall we say, not slim nations. Uh, um, the incidence of obesity has more than doubled in the past 20 years. 14, so I'm just using Australia as an example, but you can extrapolate it to America, to Canada, and the developed world. Uh, 14 million Australians are now classified as overweight or obese. Now, I think the, the ruler they use is probably a little bit hard, but it's, not a, it's still not a good look. There's only 22 million Australians, so it's, it's not a good look. Uh, obesity now costs the Australian government. The last time they did figures was a few years ago, 50, um, 56 billion dollars. Now, for the Australian economy, that, that's an enormous cost. And if you think that's bad, and the projections are that in the United States, 
by the year 2018, the cost of obesity to American society will be something like $344 billion. So my colleague spoke about funding. I mean, surely we can hit up these governments for some preventative medicine. Seriously. And anyhow, so where, where's all this going? Um, it's going to a place called the, the Centre for Genomic Medicine. That was, uh, a, someone had a brilliant light bulb moment back in around 2006, 2007. And they put together this, uh, in Western Australia, this, this Centre for Genomic Medicine. So they've had doctors, they had um, geneticists, plant breeders, uh, the whole holistic approach to the problem from growing it to getting positive outcomes in the people who ate the end product. It's amazing, it, a really brilliant idea. So this, this slide gives you a bit of an idea of kind of how it all fits in together. So I guess that's where the approach, this Lupin driven, the CFGM driven approach is different to my colleagues. I think what they, what they have achieved is, is to um, get a lot of these products, um, uh, sorry, it's the wrong side. I can't read, I've got my wrong glasses on. Anyway, these, these are the characteristics that the researchers found out for, for lupins and, and how it can help in, in the, the fight against diabetes and obesity. Hang on. Oh, this thing's not working. So, sorry, that's what I was going to get onto. I think what, what they kind of found out, what their, their strategy was, is rather than try and find new ways and new packaging and all those things, which have to happen. I mean, that's, that's an important sector of the market. That's the, the Y generation. That's what people do when they tweet each other, blah, But rather than that, which you have to deal with, if we can find a way to make people better and not know they're making themselves better, we fix the problem. And the classic example is bread. With, with lupin flour having, a, if you can get 20% inclusion of lupin flour into a loaf of bread, you pick up on all these benefits. And it's happened. They have now got bakeries in West Australia who are starting to do this. And that's another very innovative Australian company called Irwin Valley Foods, which for those who are interested was actually started as a, a farmer cooperative who actually wanted to get in to downstream processing. So, <laughs> a little more light on the subject. No, I'm pretty much done, thank you. So, bread, uh, using it, the loop and flour and bread is like a classic example. And we go through to here. And also, this one shows, um, this is the one I really loved. And the, one of the main things that they found with the inclusion of lupins is that it is, it is an appetite suppressant. So how good would it be to take your kids into Big M and they want to, to downsize, not upsize? It could happen. And that was the benefit on the... Um, uh, I can't even read that. The... Um, you can read that. I'll just leave you with one thought, or a couple of thoughts. It's been an amazing conference. We've, we've gone from having people talk about the minimum daily intake of nutrition, and if I'd found it early enough, I could have put up for you the FAO definition of obesity. The pulse industry globally now has two problems that they can both solve with the same product or product being all kind of pulses together. And um, I think it's, an inc as Gordon touched on, I mean, this is the new market, this is the new era. All these guys had a great chat about trading red lentils, and I used to love doing that, but to me, this is, this is the future, and where the pulse industry can step up to the global plate and really, you know, make its, make its mark, make a difference. And that figure, Gavin Gibson, what do you reckon that figure is? Well, it's... I wish. 
It is the number of uh, McDonald's burgers sold every day around the world. So think about if you could get 10% inclusion in that, it's a big market out there. But I mean, that's, that's a terrible example to use as McDonald's, but it's a big thing. Anyhow, again, I apologize for my slides. Um, I just wish everyone used Mac. And I'd just like to thank these people, uh, particularly Carolyn Williams. The, the stuff they've done over at this Centre for Genomic Research is just is absolutely brilliant. And I think, you know, we, this can be the other way of, of tackling some of these problems. Thank you. But I want to start with the question, and Manuel, I'm going to ask you the question. And, and we've had kind of an interesting panel discussion here. We've had private sector companies. Um, we've had trading and, and food companies, and, and we've had Peter talk about some of the work that national associations and, and sort of crop-specific uh, work has done. So the question I have, Manuel, is how do we integrate the role of uh, private food companies, national and international associations like U.S. Dry Pea and Lentil and Cecil Ziptick, and the research work that's being done in, in the academic community? We, we have this enormous opportunity, so how do we harness the private sector, the public sector, and the work that associations are doing? So Manuel, I'm going to start with you, and then uh, Paulo, I'm going to ask you the same question. Well, uh, for us, uh, an association like uh, CISILS is a fantastic uh, gathering point to exchange uh, ideas, uh, to get a lot of uh, knowledge that in the industry by itself we can uh, miss because in any sector uh, industry has a role to play but it's not the only player so we need all the other players uh, to, co to cooperate in having new ideas and also to launch and to promote these ideas which we cannot do it alone or by ourselves. And when you talk about the cooperation with uh, researchers, and especially public researchers, I think industry can give the market view, the economic view, which is absolutely complementary to the technical and the scientific work of the researchers. And I give you a practical example that we had uh, two years ago. We have been working on a, an idea that we thought that it was a, a good innovation for our sector. The idea was to uh, sell uh, dry chickpeas which could be cooked without the need of soaking them before. Uh, we got it, we got it, but obviously this product is more expensive than the normal one. No? Well, the, the market didn't accept the price increase that the innovation uh, the, obliged. And uh, if we had a good cooperation between the researcher and us as industry, an industry that has to sell finally the product, we could have avoided a lot of money and spend it in other points, much interesting for, for all of us. Thank you. It's a good question. Uh, as Pedon, during the last 10 years, uh, we introduced a number of new products, new ingredients, and uh, or new varieties. Uh, you know, for the industry, for a food industry, uh, you know, a new ingredient can be introduced when uh, uh, some uh, requisites are satisfied. Uh, sometimes uh, we have, uh, uh, we get, we get in touch with wonderful new ingredients, but uh, they are not simply not uh, workable. Uh, sometimes it is because uh, of the cost, because the cost is unsustainable for the mass market. Uh, some other times uh, it is because uh, the, we have no consistency in terms of volumes. This is a, a, an important requisite for the food manufacturers to have a consistency in terms of uh, uh, volumes. Uh, I think uh, 
it is very important uh, for all food manufacturers to uh, 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 to uh, evaluate, to assess new ingredients, and when possible to introduce it. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, people are too lazy. Uh, instead, uh, it is very important to try uh, to to uh, to explore new routes and uh, also uh, uh, to educate the consumers, because uh, uh, we saw. Uh, uh, we saw the importance of uh, the marketing, the education, in the introduction of new healthy ingredients, new healthy products. Please uh, join me in thanking the panelists uh, for our presentation on food product innovation, but also demand innovation. Thank you, panelists. To Peter Semler of AgriSim, And Paolo Pedon of Pedon SPA. Thank you once again, Gordon.